session and uh, at the beginning I also want to apologize to my book because originally I wasn't sure how much time we would have for our talks and I gave a title which I later realized was uh, trying to fight more than I could chew. So instead of trying to do this service both to methoxy species and alkyl species on uh, catalyst surfaces, I will just uh, do this service to one specific group to try to give you an idea about the surface alkyl groups or ruthenium. Of course, this follows very nicely from what uh, Mike talked about just a second ago. As Vladimir said at the beginning, IR spectroscopy has been around for a long time and uh, it's been fairly popular because of the advantages. That nowadays, at least, IR spectrometers are relatively cheap if you call $30,000 cheap for some of the FDIRs. Uh, this is a double-edged sword that is, uh, we basically can identify chemical species with reasonable certainty and find that it's not intrusive. Uh, that we can carry out our reaction while we are trying to get the infrared spectra of the surface. Well, there are other problems though. One has to always look at each technique with a critical eye. Our species resolution is poor. That means a CH2 group will look like a CH2 group whether it's in a C4 hydrocarbon or C24 hydrocarbon, unless there are other special circumstances. Uh, molar cross-sections also can change for absorbed species that are in the vicinity of the surface. Uh, as a matter of fact, several years ago, this was shown very nicely by the previous speaker that on rhodium, what we saw from IR did not necessarily give us the relative ratios of bridge and uh, linear species of CO. Of course, you need a permanent type, I don't have to remind you of that, but uh, perhaps the most the disturbing part is the last one uh, to which Vladimir uh, referred to. We can see all sorts of things on, through IR, but we haven't been very successful in relating what we saw on the surface to either the reaction rate and, or the mechanism as intermediates. And uh, I always tell my students to remember uh, something from electron microscopy that not everything you see in electron microscopy is an artifact and essentially a version of that would be is that not everything you see in IR spectroscopy actually participates in the reaction. Most of it is probably a spectator. So with that in mind I think you should take what I'm going to tell you about some of the things we have seen and I guess with the with the right attitude now. Uh, alkyl groups on ruthenium were first seen by Dalla, Beta, and Schellef in 1977. They basically didn't know whether the alkyl groups were on the support or on the metal surface itself, and their interpretation perhaps was that it was on, well, they didn't make that interpretation. They couldn't give any reasons why where they were. Uh, King in 1980 had some very good IR spectra. As a matter of fact, I was looking at them a couple days ago. The quality were almost as good as ours. And he basically attributed to the alkyl groups seen in the infrared to products that have been reabsorbed on the support. Uh, Kamaru et al. in 1981 and 82 argued that these were alkyl groups growing on ruthenium, not on the support, and uh, similarly, Professor Bell and his co-workers uh, have done quite a bit of work. I've just referred to one paper. They've done quite a bit of work on uh, alkyl groups growing on ruthenium. And Let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, this is just the standard process we use to prepare our catalyst. We use several catalysts ranging from 46% to 
while we continue, uh, prepared, supported by silica, and we used again the standard techniques. But we did not really expose our catalyst to uh, very high temperature reduction, except we followed a fairly elaborate process, both to age and reduce it before and after we put it into our infrared cell. And dispersion was fairly high, uh, as determined by CO chemisorption. One thing, of course, we've learned along the way is that infrared by itself really is difficult to get conclusive evidence from, so one has to accompany with other means of transient response techniques that I, I think Alex will talk about later. And in our case, we had the ability to look at the products coming out of the infrared reactor, both with a mass spectrometer and also with a gas chronograph, and that proved to be enormously helpful. I won't bore you with large numbers of infrared spectra, but rather uh, I'll just give you one at the beginning. This is a typical spectra at the beginning of the reaction uh, of our reduced catalyst. We've just introduced a 3 to 1 mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and follow the spectrum as a function of time in the CA stretching region. Of course, we get the whole spectrum, but for our purposes today, I will mostly concentrate on the CA stretching region. Early at the beginning, one can identify five peaks or shoulders. One, this one here at about 20, the high frequency one is at about 2983 to 2990. Uh, I don't have it listed, I think, here, but that perhaps is the only one that launched an intermediate, uh, that is an active intermediate. Uh, it's been assigned to a variety of CH2 or CH species uh, seen by UHP <coughs> studies, H reels, and perhaps sometimes as infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy. The other things, uh, 29, 59 uh, can be assigned to CH3 asymmetric stretch, 29, 27, which is this big one here. That is the asymmetric stretch of the CH2 group. Then we have a CH stretch here, <coughs> which is the clearly visible early during the reaction at 28, 27 centimeters, and then, the, excuse me, 28, 70. And then we have the CH3 asymmetric stretch and CH2 asymmetric symmetric stretch. So CH3 symmetric and CH2 symmetric stretches. So we could be discern a, essentially five peaks. Uh, interestingly enough, the ratios of, uh, well, we did a little bit of calibration because the spectra can be dis distorted by scattering from the uh, fine powder of the catalyst support and also before interpreting it one needs to calibrate the extinction coefficients for the CH2 and CH3 groups to see whether they are comparable to liquid hydrocarbons which we found out that all these frequencies by the way particularly for the CH3 and CH2 groups are almost exactly the same as uh, long chain hydrocarbon groups. We found out that their ratios and the relative cross-sections, etc., were fairly close to. Uh, well, how did we interpret the results? And we did basically something very similar to Mike did in interpreting his NMR spectra in the sense that we took this compound CA stretch curve or peak or band and we composed it into its individual components, essentially the, the CH2 asymmetric stretch, CH2 symmetric stretch, and the same for CH3, then we have a CH here. Essentially, our analysis of the curves were, was basically a sum of five Gaussians, but three of those are not independent. That is, we fixed the ratio of that uh, symmetric to asymmetric stretches, and 
That gives us only one for the CH3, one for CH, and one for CH2. I should further add that uh, because I, I'm always uh, aware of fitting an element with six independent parameters uh, with an only list squares. Uh, the only thing that varied in our fitting was the intensity of the peaks. Yeah, the frequencies were fixed, the peak widths were fixed, we just varied the intensities. And what type of information can we get out of that? Uh, Basically, the CH3 stretch areas obviously gives us the number of CH3 groups. Uh, CH2 stretch areas is proportional to the number of CH2 groups in our alkyl <coughs> species, and CH stretch areas gives us the tertiary linkages with CH groups. Uh, with that, one could do a little bit of perhaps manipulation. Okay. And from terminal CH2 groups, one could get a relative number of alkyl chains growing on the surface. Uh, from CH groups, if we assume that the CH groups are in the chain, well, then each CH group represents a branch point. And it gives us a degree of branching. Find it from the ratio of CH2 to CH3 groups. After correcting for branching, we can get the chain length of the hydrocarbons on the surface. Uh, before going into the details, we decided to take a look at a couple of simple things. Namely, we decided to look at the uh, dependence of hydrogen partial pressure, CO partial pressure, and temperature. I'm just going to show you something for the hydrogen partial pressure. Uh, the reason, of course, we wanted to look at those was to determine whether they were intermediates. If If you look 
get the number of alkyl chains growing on the surface, it turns out that there are essentially two regions, a uh, very rapid growth at the beginning and then a leveling off. I put here something, uh, surface coverage by these alkyl groups at that point, we find that it's about 2.5% of a monolayer. Uh, that obviously we didn't determine from IR directly, but through a combination of uh, <coughs> isotopic exchange and combustion of what's on the surface. But the important point is though, on a carbon basis, we seem to have close to a monolayer, but on a, a number of alkyl chains bound to the surface, we have something quite small. They appear to occupy only 2 to 3 percent of the surface size. Uh, if one is, we also did some other work correlating that increase in the number of sites to which surface alkyl groups were bound. It turned out that the increase in the alkyl groups corresponded almost exactly to the decrease in the uh, active carbonic carbon surface sites. Well, uh, this here I have something different. This is the chain length as a function of time. That is, we basically took the number of uh, CH2 groups and divide them by terminal CH3 to obtain how many carbon atoms we have on, in each chain. I should point out that there are some significant assumptions involved in this process. Uh, one being that we basically assume that each branch point essentially stopped after adding a CH3 group, which may or may not be true. But you see that at the very beginning, the chain length increases tremendously. We have not been able to get any ratio below seven, as a matter of fact. Uh, after the initial portion, uh, we essentially have a linear chain growth. Uh, again, it's a matter of patience. Uh, we didn't really see this leveling go. Well, let me just throw one more piece of information there. We also found out through looking at the CH or branch tertiary CH groups, uh, we found out that the branching increases as a function of time. This is vertical axis essentially is uh, the number of CH2 groups per CH group. And as time goes on, the alkyl group increases in the uh, number of branch points on the alkyl group increase. Well, one question we wanted to look at, you know, the previous information appeared to be reasonable, but it still was amazing to us that we have 30 carbon atoms uh, bound at one point. We wanted to verify this and we decided to do some hydrogen isotope exchange. And uh, there are two models, obviously, the alkyl groups are associated this way. These hydrogens are far away from the surface, so they shouldn't be really exchanging easily. Uh, we would expect exchange of these hydrogens relatively rapidly, but not these. And similarly, if we had the other model, if the alkyl group was laying on the surface, we should see rapid exchange of a lot of hydrogen. Well, we performed the transient response experiment, which I must say we learned from Alex again, uh, that of uh, switching between C12, C13, and hydrogen and deuterium. Essentially, the experiment we did was that we built the alkyl groups on the surface with CO and hydrogen, then we switched to CO and D2 for an hour, and afterwards we quickly exchange the gas phase or chemisorbed molecularly adsorbed CO by 12 CO by 13 CO to move this CO adsorption peak downfield. And then we follow the spectra. Interestingly enough, uh, what we saw in the CD stretch range region excuse me, is just a pure CD2 spectrum. We do not have any CH peaks at all. What this implies is that essentially we are incorporating the deuterium from the root of the chain in the form of CD2 groups. Uh, one could do some other process. 
interacting with that and basically what we did was to look at the residence time, essentially in this case we are showing the decay of CHX groups on the surface, but we one ends up with an amazing residence time on the surface. Now, I should point out that this, this residence time is normally valid for our reaction conditions, it depends on the temperature and pressure. Temperature, pressure, and the reactant composition. So three and a half, three hours of half-life is fairly long, I must say. Um, I don't have, I won't bore you with the details of the modeling, but uh, we decided to see if we could perhaps model the growth of the alkyl species on the surface. Essentially, what we did was to borrow from uh, our colleagues in Polymerization, we took the anionic polymerization type of polymerization equations that assume that initiation rate constant, propagation rate constant, and uh, in this case we have a desorption or decomposition, whatever you want to call it, rate, step, and uh, number of initial sites. So our model basically had four parameters. Uh, number of sites on which the alkyl groups can grow, the initiation rate, constant propagation, growth by C2, CH2, and uh, a break off of the chains. It turns out, you know, taking it with a grain of salt that we have uh, several adjustable parameters, the growth can be quite accurately fitted with that type of a model. And the interesting point, of course, is that the initiation rate constant is very high, we have a reasonably large propagation rate constant and uh, uh, termination or in this case desorption rate constant is quite low. This is very similar to an ionic polymerization in which case you have uh, nucleation, very rapid nucleation and then one has what's called living polymers growing on uh, continuously growing and the rate of growth depends on the supply of reactants. Uh, this slide essentially shows that, that the surface alkyl groups do not get hydrogenated unless some of the CO desorbs. We see that the CO here shown in black, uh, after it starts desorbing, the alkyl groups react very rapidly. The time scale here is actually uh, the C beta peak Mike Duncan showed, and it is much more clearly seen in this transparency, where we basically took the derivative of the IR spectrum as a function of time at the, and arrived at the black points. Uh, the other one is the type of transient one sees in the gas phase. This is the carbidic or C alpha peak, and this is the C beta peak, the hollow squares. But you can see that the C beta peak for the gas phase superimposes very nicely with the alkyl surface alkyl rate, rate of reaction curve or derivative of the surface alkyl by infrared spectra. Okay, since I'm running out of time, I would uh, not go into the role of volatiles uh, on the surface, and I want to save some time for questions. Well, let me. Conclude. At least we believe alkyl groups are mostly singly bound and only a small fraction of the surface sites are suitable for alkyl groups due to the fact that they need CO and uh, something that I didn't mention that the amount of alkyl groups growing on the surface gets affected significantly by mild sintering treatment, we speculate that they are, they grow on low coordination sites, whether they are formal or rich, I don't know. Uh, again, uh, there is a relatively short initiation period during which rapid chain growth starts on all the available sites, we then have propagation only. Uh, structurally, the surface alkyl groups are very similar to high molecular weight alkanes. There is some branching and Hydrogenolysis it appears to be the primary reaction, at least uh, in the presence of hydrogen, by which the alkyl groups react and leave the surface.
surface. And the other part is that high surface coverage of carbon monoxide is necessary for stabilization of optimums on the surface. Uh, let's see. Well, we've seen positive dependence on CO partial pressure. I couldn't really give you any information about this part, but uh, we see a difference between CO and uh, hydrogen partial pressure dependence in that if one analyzes in terms of the model, and I have a polymerization model, we find that uh, when we analyze the data with respect to CO partial pressure, we find that the number of surface sites increase with CO partial pressure, whereas in the case of hydrogen, uh, we don't see the number of surface sites increasing. Um, we find that the isotope hydrogen exchange occurs only at the root of the chain. I won't go into that because I didn't show you any information about that. And again, this is redundant, that it's possible to model alkyl growth by a simple anionic polarization process. The catch there is that we don't have independent parameters. Uh, and this is something uh, one can find the relatively easily after the isotope exchange. We find that in steady state, somewhere between 1 and 10 percent of the gas-based products that we've observed are due to the breakdown of the surface alkyl groups. So they are real spectators. They don't participate significantly in the fischer torch reaction, but uh, they give some products, not a whole lot. Thank you very much. We are coming to the next paper.